Thank you. So this is Addie Rarisich. This photo of Addie was taken when she was 11 years old, living in Tucson, Arizona. Addie was a happy, healthy young girl who loved to run track, swim, play softball. Then one day, Addie began to experience a pain in her hip. Within a week, Addie was in the ICU. She had acquired an infection. Addie did not leave the hospital for the next five months. Instead, Addie spent it fighting multiple drug-resistant infections that she acquired while she was in the hospital. One of these infections was in her lungs. Ultimately, Addie had to be put on a machine called ECMO, which acts as an ex external lung. It circulates your blood and adds oxygen to it. Doctors felt that in order to save her life, a double lung transplant would be required. But to do the transplant, they needed to get the number of bacteria in her body, um, the numbers down. So they put her on a last-line antibiotic known as colistin. Colistin is known to be very harmful to the kidneys as well as your other internal organs. Fortunately, Addie survived um, the lung transplant. However, when Addie walked out of the hospital five months later, she had lost most of the vision in her left eye. She had reduced vision in her right eye. She had lost the use of her left arm, as well as had reduced uh, mobility in her left leg. And this is because she suffered a stroke that was um, a result of a complication with treating her original infection. And the total health care cost for Addie's five-month hospital stay was $6 million. And Addie is just one of two million Americans that are diagnosed with drug-resistant infections every year, 23,000 of whom die. So we see resistance developing across all the different antimicrobial drugs that we've developed, whether they be antiretrovirals, um, antibiotics, antimalarials. So if we zoom in on one that we're all familiar with, penicillin, what this figure shows is um, each line represents a drug, and when it was first introduced to markets, when the line begins, and it tapers off when resistance is observed in the patient. So when we look at penicillin, it was introduced in the early 1940s, and resistance was developed um, by about 1950. In fact, Alexander Fleming predicted this would happen um, in his 1945 Nobel Prize acceptance speech. And this problem isn't just limited to the United States. The World Health Organization has labeled drug resistance a global health threat. And this is largely out of concern about um, resistance we're seeing in a common, um, to common bacteria as well as fungal infections. In fact, they've even gone as far as to say if we don't do something about this problem, we're going to enter into a post-antibiotic era where even just simple common infections kill and we can no longer do basic surgeries. Another issue is that the antibiotics we have are being misused. And also that new antibiotics in general aren't being produced. And this is because there really is no financi financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies to produce antibiotics um, when it costs hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars, to bring a new drug to market just to see resistance develop um, in a couple of years. Okay, so now let's get a little bit into the science of drug resistance. This is the classical view of drug resistance, which I'm going to call genetic drug resistance. So this means so the invading microorganism has acquired a change in their DNA sequence, a mutation that gives them resistance. So if we look at this figure, on the left we start off with a population of cells, and there's one mutant there shown in red. Then we apply the drug, all the other cells die, the mutant survives. This mutant continues to, draw, uh, to, um, to, to grow and divide inside the body of the patient, and ultimately you end up with a population of drug-resistant cells where all the cells have um, that genetic mutation. And a question I often ask myself is, why can't we deal with this? When the majority of life that's ever existed on this planet has gone extinct due to facing challenges it could not overcome, why can we not clear infections from, from patients? And there are several reasons for it. One is, as we just saw, these organisms adapt and evolve. This is just evolution by natural selection in action. The other is that we're limited in the, in the, the degree of selective pressure we can apply when we're treating a patient. So we have to consider the health of the patient as well as the side effects of the drugs. In the lab, we can kill anything in a test tube if we apply enough bleach, right, <laughs> enough heat to it. But when we treat real patients, it's, it's much more difficult. But perhaps it's also because we don't yet fully understand the process of drug resistance. For example, drug resistance can also be 
um, attributed to non-genetic mechanisms. This is something that we've discovered over the last couple of years. And this photo is taken from our lab. And what it shows is the cells that are glowing green are expressing a drug resistance gene, and the cells that are dark are not. And so when, when we apply the drug, the green cells survive, um, and the other cells succumb to the effect of the drug. And why this is so fascinating, this photo, is because all the cells in that photo are genetically identical. They all have the exact same DNA. They're all growing in the same environment, we're treating with the same drug, and yet a fraction of them survive. And this blew our mind because we were expecting that genetically identical cells in the same environment would either, would they behave the same way? They'd either all die when we gave them the drug, or they would all survive, or they would, yeah, all survive. But that's not what we saw. And in fact, these are yeast cells, but we've seen this in different cell types and when we use different types of drugs. So there are actually a few mechanisms that govern this non-genetic drug resistance. One is that chemical reactions have an element of randomness associated with them. So inside a cell, you've got molecules moving around, and for a chemical reaction to occur, these molecules have to find each other, they have to collide, and they have to do so with the right um, energy and the right orientation. And when you look at a cell population, what this does is this introduces a little bit of cell-to-cell -cell variability. Um, there's also what's known as epigenetic effects. And what this typically means is that while, while the DNA sequence is not changed, you can have modifications to the DNA, um, such as DNA methylation. And this has been shown to have implications in drug resistance. So one hypothesis that we're actively investigating is that this non-genetic variability can lead um, to genetic drug resistance. And so the situation here is you're starting on the left, you have a mixed population, you have some green cells, some, um, some blue cells, and they're all genetically identical. So there's no mutation here. Then we apply the drug, and the difference between the green and the blue cells is that the green cells are expressing a high level um, of a drug resistance protein, um, whereas the blue cells are expressing a low level. So when we apply the drug, the green cells survive. This gives the cells in the population a chance to acquire a drug resistance mutation. So now you see you have a couple of red cells there. The green cells eventually die, they eventually succumb to the effect of the drug because inside the cell, these levels of these drug resistance proteins are fluctuating. So it's high initially, they're surviving, and then it falls down below a threshold, um, and then the cells die. And then, but these mutants keep growing and dividing, and eventually you end up with um, a genetically drug-resistant population. And with a new paradigm comes the need for new tools. So you may be surprised to, to learn that we use mathematics and synthetic biology to study drug resistance. So mathematical modeling is very useful to us because it allows us not only to design our synthetic gene circuits, but it also allows us to make predictions about how these cells will behave in different drug environments. And this is really useful to us because there is a huge state space of possible experiments that we can do in the wet lab. And these mathematical models allow us to pinpoint some, some potential winners and narrow down this state space. And so we can save a lot of money and time um, in the wet lab. Also, when we do drug resistance experiments, we often produce huge amounts of data. You can have terabytes of data for a single experiment. And then we have to make sense of that. And the mathematical modeling helps us to elucidate some general principles about drug resistance from this data. The second tool we use is synthetic biology. Uh, you may have heard about this in terms of the genetic engineering of food crops, uh, maybe biofuel production or biomedicine. You can engineer yeast cells, uh, for example, to produce anti-malarial medications. But we're not using it for this purpose. We're using it for basic research on drug resistance. And the reason we use synthetic biology is because it allows us to precisely control the genes that we think might be involved in, in drug resistance. And also when we build these synthetic gene circuits, some of these components haven't evolved inside the host cell. So they're not highly connected um, to the host cell's genome. And this helps us draw some general conclusions about uh, the drug resistant mechanisms that we're investigating. Okay. Another discovery we've made is that the structure of a gene network can enhance drug resistance. So genes don't exist in isolation. They exist in these networks where they can turn on and off other genes, and in turn, other genes can turn them on and off. And by gene network structure, I mean the way that the genes are connected to and regulate each other. And this particu particular gene network structure that you're looking at has been implicated in 
multiple drug resistance in yeast cells, but also in human breast cancer cells. And if you look at gene two, it's, so it's activating gene three, but it's also activating itself. So there's a positive feedback loop here. And that positive feedback is exactly what is allowing the cells in the photo I showed you to switch from the dark susceptible state into the drug resistant green state. Studying networks is also very useful because it allows us um, to identify potentially some new therapeutic targets. So what was this talk about? So um, drug resistance is the Achilles heel of modern medicine. It is undermining many of the treatments we have for common bacterial and fungal infections, as well as the treatment of many forms of cancer. We're using an interdisciplinary approach. In fact, I myself am interdisciplinary. I hold a PhD in physics, but I do research in biology. And on a daily basis, I work with mathematicians, chemists, card-carrying biologists. Um, and this interdisciplinary approach allows us to tackle old problems from a new angle, such as combining um, synthetic biology with mathematical modeling. And this is leading to new breakthroughs in the study of drug resistance. For example, we found that this non-genetic cell-to-cell variability uh, can facilitate the development of drug resistance, and also that gene network structure can enhance drug resistance. And what we hope is that ultimately this basic research will translate into better therapies for patients like Addy with drug-resistant infections and cancers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.